We are in America's County, Somerset County. This is a nickname that's been recently bestowed to one of the free counties in the Laurel Highlands in the past 20 years, namely for two major events that occurred in the span of less than a year. The most famous of which is the crash of Flight 93, one of the four hijacked planes during 9-11. It crashed in a rural part of Somerset County, about 10 miles from where I'm currently standing. Less than a year after this crash, Another event would occur that would bring national attention back to Somerset County. It was perceived that it would be another tragedy ending up in Somerset's record books, but it turned out to be what some call a miracle. We are here at the Cute Creek Mine Rescue Site, and we're going to explore the miracle that occurred on this farm 20 years ago. Let's go back to 2001, March 2001 to be precise. That's been the Black Wolf Coal Company opens up Cute Creek Number 1, which would have been about a mile over my shoulder over that direction. Uh, it's a brand new mine. Uh, it's only about a year old by July of 2002. Uh, they've dug quite a distance back in, uh, but the mine will become far bigger in future years. So keep in mind, this is at the time of the incident, this is a relatively new mine. Now, to expand the mine, they had to buy more property, which required researching old abandoned mines that are in the region. So, Somerset County has well over a hundred years of coal mining history, has had hundreds of mines dotting the county and beyond. And some of these mines weren't properly marked well. One of those mines was the Saxman uh, Co Coal Company mine, known as Harrison No. 2. Uh, officially, it ended uh, operation in 1964, but when Q Creek began operating, they were only operating right up against Harrison Number Two. They were in the immediate vicinity, so when they were buying more property to expand Q Creek Number One, they had to go get proper maps to make sure that they wouldn't puncture a hole through Harrison Number Two. Now, if you're wondering, well, Spencer, it's just an abandoned mine. Well, what's the issue? Well, mines are underground, and what happens when things are underground? Fill up with water over time. The water table seeps into the ruins of the mines and they become underground lakes so uh, we gotta make sure that we don't puncture through and cause a flood about that so after doing some research it appears that the black wolf coal company and other people associated with Cuc number one they were able to produce a uncertified map from Cons uh, console energy from 1964 right when harrison 2 closed and roughly that map said that the q creek number one would be about 300 feet away from harrison number two state law at the time allowed mining to be uh, mining near a abandoned mine within 200 feet so they have about 100 feet of wiggle room what they're going to do is they're going to start digging what is known as first left which branches off from the mains and they're going to come up actually it's coming uphill from the bottom of, uh, of the main number q creek number one mine coming uphill right behind me and eventually first left is going to end over where that lake is about 240 feet under where that small lake is on the night of July 24th, 2002, it's a Wednesday, the evening shift has gone in. There are 18 miners within Q Creek number one. One, a, t a group of nine is working down at the head of the mains, so they're at the very bottom of the coal mine. And there's another group of nine that are working first left, right underneath our feet. They are under the impression that they are within safe distance of Harrison number two, that there's 300 feet separating them between Harrison number two. In reality, the maps are neglected to point out an extension of one of the Harrison Number Two tunnels, probably bored at the very final months of operation, which may be why it doesn't show up on the maps. Instead of digging with under 300 feet of Harrison Number Two, they were digging within three feet. So about 240 feet below where that pipe is in the pond today is where the Q Creek mine breached into Harrison number two of the Saxon Coal Company. And very quickly, 50 million gallons of water poured down into first lap, going right underneath our feet. Now I believe there are about eight tunnels in Kew Creek number one where we're roughly standing. All of that is gonna become flooded. There was the continuous miner, which would have been somewhere underneath the ground there. It weighs about, yes, I'm cheating off my notes, don't laugh at me. It weighs 
50 tons. That continuous miner was thrown back 60 feet back into first left. That's how powerful the force of the water was. Dennis Hall, one of the nine miners, quickly raced for the nearest phone and called up the team that were at the main and shouted, hollered, cussed at them to get out of the mines. This was not a drill. The mine was being flooded and they had to get out. Because keep in mind, those other nine men that are down at the mains, they're below the other nine miners that have just breached into first left. The group of nine down to Mains quickly hurried onto golf carts and man trips, trying to make a break for the intersection. They gotta get past the intersection and toward the main entry portal before it becomes flooded with water. By the time the by the time this group of nine get back from the first mains, they already find it's completely flooded. They're gonna be able to get into an air shaft, climb their way around the intersection, and they're still, now although they're climbing for the air shaft, the air shaft itself is starting to get flooded with water. So these guys are freak, frozen cold, but they manage to get through the air shaft before it floods, get up onto a golf cart and ride their way out of the portal. As for the other nine, they are trapped underground, completely cut off as the water completely fills the intersection and starts filling back up first left. Now, since where the breach occurred is above where the intersection is of the two shafts in the mine, these nine men are gonna make their way back to the breach location, assuming this is the best location for rescue. Very quickly, a rescue team is gonna be scrambled together back down at the mouth of Q Creek number one, trying to figure out what they're gonna to do to get the other nine men out of the mine. They're gonna to turn to Bob Long, who is a uh, engineer who has with them a state-of-the-art GPS system. Now keep in mind, this is 2002. GPS is still in its infancy. I believe that his equipment cost about $60,000 in 2002 currency. Bob Long and another team of engineers are going to have to figure out where exactly the miners are in order to drill at least an air shaft down to them to try to figure out where they are. Now, the miners are 200 feet, 240 feet under where I'm standing. It's kind of hard to figure out where they actually are, isn't it now? Well, when they laid out these mines, they had been able to, they had to do underground surveying, pinpointing every dot along the mains as they dug the mine. So they have the maps of the underground surveyors surveying. All they got to do is now do it above ground. What they're going to do is they're going to use the state-of-the-art GPS system of Bob Long's. They're going to walk from the main portal and follow the underground map using the GPS. They're gonna walk over land, they're gonna come over Route 985, and they're gonna come into the property of Bill and Lori Arnold, who have the Dormel Dairy Farm, which is I am now standing upon. And they are eventually going to pinpoint where they believe the miners are to right about over here. By the early morning of July 25th, a drilling rig is on location to bore a six and a half inch hole into the mine as, a rest, as an air shaft. Here is the top of that very air shaft. This was bored by a drill commanded by Bartell Drilling Company, who are owned by Louis Bartels. Uh, they're nearby here in Somerset County, and that is one of the stories that make this so unique, this incident. That there were several major drilling companies all within a few miles drive of where I'm standing. But the first hole that was drilled was this air shaft dug 240 feet into the ground. When Bartel's drill pierces through, the engines are cut. Silence falls over here. They can hear tapping coming from the bottom of the pipe, which means somebody is alive in there, which means they're going to move to the next phase of rescue, digging a rescue shaft to pull whoever's down there out. Now, when this air shaft gets down to the miners, it is a drill that's operated with compressed air. The compressed air is at about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. That is hot air being pumped into a cold, damp, flooded mine right now, which is something the miners desperately needed. So not only are they getting air once this drill breaks through, but now they're starting to raise the temperature of the chamber they're trapped in. Not by much, mind you, they were still freezing, but enough to keep them from falling immediately into hyperthermia. That is still however a threat. But just because they've gotten air to the miners now, there's still the issue of how they're going to get them out. 
And to make matters worse, when this drill went through, essentially popped an air bubble that was keeping the miners from being swamped. Very quickly, the waters rose up, forcing the miners to retreat several tunnels over, back up to where the highway is today, 240 feet down. They, end, they get stuck into entry number one. They're able to use cement blocks that are normally used in a mine to block off uh, air currents to allow for proper air ventilation in the mine. They use those concrete blocks to build a bit of a barricade, trying to keep the floodwaters out, but it's to no avail. By 9 in the morning on July 25th, water is now pouring outside of the mouth of the Kew Creek Mine. Very quickly, other drills are going to be brought in in the surrounding area and they're going to be starting piercing boreholes all across the landscape in Somerset County, trying to dewater the mine as much as they can. In order to rescue the miners, they got to lower the water level. Joe Gallo, an engineer of the Black Wolf Coal Company, who's in charge of Q Creek Number One, is going to start racing around on his phone, contacting as many drillers and coal engineers that he knows to bring as much drilling equipment on this location as quickly as possible. And he's not just talking to people locally; he's talking to people around the world. And one of those people he's going to contact is a guy by the name of Dwayne Yost, owner of Gene D. Yost and Son Incorporated, a drilling company. Now, Yost is more than happy to bring a drilling rig up, but they are all the way down near Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. That's in way off in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. So in the meantime, as Yost gets his rig ready to bring it up here to Somerset County, he's going to contact Keystone Drilling, who are about four miles from the rescue site. You can't make up how lucky they were that there is a drilling company just four miles from the rescue site. He contacts him, get the property bits needed to bore a 30 inch hole that will be a rescue shaft to pull the miners out and by 6 p.m. on July 25th Yost's drilling rig and Keystone's drilling bit are going to be used to begin boring a hole through rescue shaft number one and we are looking at rescue shaft number one right now Once again though, it won't matter if they can drill a rescue shaft if they can't get the water level away from the miners. And by this point, nine miners were all grouped together, huddled up inside tunnel number one, all the way up, very little room to move. Some of their walls have been washed over. And it's at this point they assume that they are not going to make it out. Uh, this is considered the time during the incident where a lot of them begin writing, writing for uh, farewell letters to loved ones. They put those letters into a bucket they found flowing around. They even tied themselves together into one bunch to make sure they wouldn't get washed away, that their bodies would be able to be recovered. I'm in this little shelter that they have out here at the monument and just barely about four feet tall. This is a space that the nine miners would have roughly been huddled in. This is all the more height they have when they were huddled together and unsure what was going to happen if the rescue team was going to get to them or they would be swamped by the waters beforehand. I do not like it at all. But things are going to change for them. Their hopes are going to rise when they hear the sound of a drill starting to make its way underneath the dirt. They realize rescue is on their way they just need to hold out and keep the water from reaching them. Finally, everything is starting to go smoothly. Rescue shaft number one is being bored down to about 100 feet. They're about halfway to rescue the miners. When in the early morning hours of July 26, the drill stops. Initially, it was believed that the hard rock they were boring through had kind of got hung up on the drill. So they started lifting it up. It's not entirely what happened. It wasn't hung up the bit of the drill had completely broken off the hammer. There is now a 1,500 pound piece of metal stuck in the shaft meant to rescue these nine miners. Now, you can salvage a broken drill bit. That's not the problem. The problem is it's 100 feet down underground, you cannot see, and the object you need to retrieve it 
is basically the equivalent of a fishing hook for drill rigs. And you don't just go to Lowe's to buy one of that. You have to custom make it. The manufacturer of that drill bit has to custom make it. So they're scrambling around to found somebody who could quickly make this fishing tool to pull out the broken drill bit. And they found somebody up in central Pennsylvania to do it. So while they're manufacturing this fishing tool to pull out the drill bit, they got to start work of a second shaft. They cannot stop now. So Falcon Drilling from Indiana, Pennsylvania, who were already on site boring one of the dewatering holes, are going to be brought in with their drilling rig, and they're going to start boring shaft number two on July 26, 2002. Finally, after a day's worth of collaboration between multiple drilling companies from not only across Pennsylvania but across the country, they've manufactured the fishing tool to pull out the broken drill bit. And it's actually flown in by a National Guard helicopter from central Pennsylvania right here to the, uh, to the Dormel farm, where it's dropped off and is used, put down to shaft number one. It took only two tries. The second try, they get it hooked on, and out comes the broken drill bit. They'll put on a new bit, and they'll continue boring down the rest of the way into the shaft. The rescue is back on. Drilling had resumed late hours of July 26, 2002, and was going uh, through July 27th, but there was constant stopping and going because the deeper they're going down those drill bits, the harder the limestone and other rocks in this region become. And they're constantly gnawing at both drill bits on shaft number one and shaft number two. And eventually the drill bit on shaft number two also broke. But all of these delays may have been a blessing in disguise. I mentioned earlier that when that six inch air shaft had been poured, uh, had been pierced through, kind of popped an air bubble that was keeping air around the miners. And very quickly that water had rushed up and pinned the miners into entry number one, where they were holding out hope that the water would not rise any further. They tried building a barricade that didn't work out too well. So this several hour delay actually bought time for the other drill sites around Somerset County to pump out enough water to lower the water level. Now, although by July 27th, the water was be, it, it appeared to be going down, there still was the issue of the buildup air that was been pumped into the pocket. They were fearful that the air was so compressed where the miners were, that if they were brought off without the proper safety, they would suffer from the bends, from decompression sickness. As such, there were Navy technicians on site and they custom engineered this airlock the idea was going to be to put the airlock on top of the rescue shaft and seal it up. So when they would be brought to the surface, they would properly uh, change the air climate for the miners before they were brought officially to the surface. But the air shaft was never needed because in part the water level was dropped low enough that finally in the late hours of July 27, 2002, Rescue shaft number one broke through 240 feet down into the Kew Creek mine. Now initially it said that they were going to bore it at 30 inches of diameter, but because the rock was becoming too heavy to cut through by the drill bits causing constant delays, they often said to bring it out to a 26 inch diameter bore. It had been since the early hours of July 25th that anybody had heard any noise coming from it within the Kew Creek mine. Now that the rescue shaft was bored through, now was the moment to learn had they succeeded or had they been too late. A communications device is gonna be dropped down through the air shaft all the way down into the chamber. All nine are alive. In the early morning hours of July 28, 2002, a rescue capsule will be lowered down the shaft to the nine trapped miners. Coming down with them are emergency supplies, such as blankets, helmets, lighting, first aid kits, Hershey bars, uh, cans of stuff. <laughs> uh, they did ask for a beer, the miners, but the doctors forbade them of going that far. So the miners, for their whole experience, were still in good spirits.
At 1 a.m. on July 28, 2002, Randy Fogel, the foreman of the group of nine miners in charge of First Left, will be the first miner brought to the surface in the rescue capsule. He was brought up first because he had been complaining of chest pains uh, throughout the ordeal. <laughs> ourselves to the standard of nine for nine we're going to bring everybody up one of the guys we took up was wide-eyed when he got right to the mid hill right here at the middle of the hill because he looked around and saw 200 people and all this equipment you know what he said to me god bless america yeah, yeah. Yeah. when he saw the equipment and the people he said, God bless America, and he meant to say, look at all this American ingenuity. It's American ingenuity and teamwork that brought us to this point, and the fact that the whole world knows about Pennsylvania's mining heritage, Pennsylvania's technology, and Pennsylvania workers and their savvy, and their commitment, and their determination. Nine for nine. So within 77 hours, this dairy farm turned into the center of the United States. <laughs> Hundreds of people were here helping to rescue these nine men. Then afterwards, they all packed up and went home and things went almost back to normal. This still is an operating dairy farm. The Dormel farm goes back by 200 years for age and is currently operated by the Arnold family, still operated by the Arnold family. but. This small portion of the farm has now become a monument to those that were rescued and those that helped in the rescue effort, which became known not as the Cute Creek Mine Disaster, but the Cute Creek Mine Rescue, or as some like to call it, the Cute Creek Mine Miracle. Several trees have been planted by the Q Creek Mine Rescue Memorial Foundation to commemorate, to make this lovely little park where the rescue occurred. Uh, in the center, they planted a red oak, which symbolizes the faith that the rescuers and the miners both had in each other, that this plan would work off. And all around the red oak of faith, there are nine evergreens representing each miner. could be mistaken, but I believe the nine stones which are around the trees represent what are, they've been dubbed the forgotten nine. The first nine miners that were able to get up through that air shaft, swim through the waters, get into that golf cart, and drive out of the mine safely. <laughs> and much like how the media had broadcast a burnt field in Somerset County in September 2001 endlessly on the news, so too would the news broadcast live from the scene the rescue of all nine miners. This news van was owned by Channel 11, WPXI, an NBC affiliate out of Pittsburgh. I might be mistaken, but I was told at a younger age that this news van was at both the Flight 93 crash site and at the Q Creek rescue. I know it was here at Q Creek and later was donated to the museum. Being a historian, I am so used to going to sites where great tragedies occurred and great loss of life happened. And it is quite refreshing to come to a site where something fantastic had occurred. Um, like I said, many people consider what happened here at Cute Creek a true miracle. And depends on who you are. I'm not going to debate on people's faith or not. But it can't help if just be in awe of what happened here. I mean, think about it. If only a few feet over had been where the mine was, they had been under a lake. They would not be able to drill under there. If they had been a few feet farther over here, the mine would have been under a road. They would have to shut a road down in order to get them out. And who knows how long that would have taken. Also keep in mind, there were several very well organized drilling companies within a few miles from where we're standing, all be able to very quickly organize onto the scene. 
this event could not have occurred at a better time in American history. Going into the early, going into the 21st century, America had high hopes. Then 9/11 happened, and for coal miners, there had been a massive explosion. Alabama had killed several miners, so this was not a really good time for the country in terms of morale. The Kew Creek Mine site is now preserved as a museum and park. You can come here to see where the rescue occurred. Uh, they have a very cool museum just up the hill here. They opened back in 2012 on the 10th anniversary of the, of the rescue. I am here just a month prior to the 20th anniversary and I hope the video will be released, released on the date when the rescue occurred. I hope you too, if you ever get the chance, you're here in Somerset County, be sure to visit out here to see what happens when Americans are pressed with their backs against the wall, what ingenuity they can come up with.